and you can hear me okay? Yeah, all good. Great, cool. So yes, as Matthias says, uh, I'm Steve West. I work for the International Brain Lab and uh, I'm working as the histology research scientist here for uh, basically reconstructing all of the brains for the IBL. Um, so I'm just going to talk today about, I mean, the main project we've really been working on in the IBL is our big brain-wide map using neuropixel probes. And so I've been doing a lot of reconstructing histologically of, of uh, brains image with this. That's what I will talk about today. So um, the first thing really to be uh, reconstructing neuropixel probes are kind of prerequisites to this, for this kind of 3D reconstruction, is first you need to have label tracks. In the International Brain Lab, we're using CM DII. Uh, this is a bit more expensive than just DII, but because there is some delays in brains, for example, getting to me, uh, and they can sit in the fridge for a little while, it's quite important to have CM DII as this permanently labels the track because the CM stands for chloromethyl, and these are a, a special group attached to the DII, which allows it to conveniently attach to proteins actually along the track. So it will remain permanently labeled there when, after you fix the tissue. Um, so this ensures you have a much brighter, more permanently labeled track than you would get with DII, which would otherwise leach through the membranes. Um, and secondly, obviously a prerequisite as well as obviously having uh, the tissue perfused and, and fixed. Uh, a few comments on that are just to make sure that the tissue is fixed quite well. Uh, this is just a really kind of standard bit of advice for histology, really. I would recommend at least a minimum of 24 hours at room temperature. Okay, so once you've got your brain, the way uh, in the International Brain Lab that we're doing this really reconstruction is using um, the serial section two photon microscope, uh, which we, we have uh, in, the, in the lab. Um, another option is to also use light sheet, which I've also been playing around with and have got to kind of work. Obviously, this requires clearing of the whole brain, first of all. Um, and I just also wanted just to quickly discuss uh, each of these methods. So firstly, with the serial section two photon microscope, uh, we have here a picture on the left, an example of one in the lab here. Um, so the idea is that you have basically a vibratome attached to a, a two photon microscope and you would have your tissue uh, volume mounted in agarose, and this is sectioned away and the block face is imaged as, as you section through the tissue. And on the right here, we just have an example of a data set reconstructed using this method. Uh, it's important to also stress that the way that I'm imaging all of these brains for this pipeline is I will always image a autofluorescent green channel in the green fluorescent range channel. Uh, this is for the actual subsequent registration of the data. And then also I'm, I'm imaging the CMDII in a, a red channel, as you can see the tracks in, in this reconstructed image here. Um, this is really the main way that we're imaging brains at the moment in the IBL. Um, the great benefit of having a serial section two photo microscope is, although it is quite slow at capturing the data, say compared to a light sheet, it's quite hands-free. You can put the brains on there and it will just run. And it takes a few hours, but it's, it's all kind of uh, taken care of by the microscope. Um, also, you can capture uh, fluorescent data from fluorescent proteins in, in this uh, setup as well, which is convenient. The second method, which I've played around with, and currently we're not using this as our kind of standard pipeline, um, is to use a clearing and then light sheet based imaging approach. And so here, really, the best methods um, that I found that work the best really are, are solvent based methods where you essentially just incubate your tissue through a series of solvents to delipidate the tissue and extract all the lipids to allow you to uh, penetrate that with, with laser light. Um, and then you mount it into some form of organic mountant. Usually I use uh, a mountain called BABB, um, which I haven't written on here, but if you have any questions, please, please ask me um, in the chat. Um, anyway, so once it's cleared in your mountains, you can image this uh, on a, a light sheet microscope. We have a a meso spin uh, light sheet microscope. There are a number available these days in, in lots of imaging facilities. Um, and you get a kind of reconstruction looking similar to what is shown here on uh, the right hand side here. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a lot faster than uh, imaging on uh, the serial section two photon, although uh, obviously the actual clearing takes some time and it's a bit more hands on. Um, and generally the resolution tends to be a bit lower for light sheets. So that's something to sort of take into account. With the kind of reconstructions that at least um, uh, I'm doing in the IBL for neuropixel probes, actually this is not too much of an issue. Working at you know, 10 microns per pixel or 25 microns per pixel is usually more than sufficient to um, understand where probe tracks are uh, in brains, uh, in the regions of the brain. Okay, so once you have your image volume, 
the next step um, is to essentially map that volume into the Allen CCF space. And because you have the whole 3D volume, uh, compared to um, the method as, as Peter, uh, Peter described earlier, um, we can do this in a much more automated way, simply. So there are a number of different um, image deformation and registration frameworks out there. The one which I've been using for this kind of reg the registration in the IBL pipeline uh, is Elastics. And the idea of uh, the deformation that takes place is essentially you have your original sample and you deform this through two steps. So you first will go uh, deform it in an affine method to try and overlay the atlas using an affine transform. So that's where it's just shifting it in a very linear manner. And then once that's quite well aligned, you then um, perform a B-spline optimization on top of that, which essentially performs little non-linear non alterations uh, to the shape of your sample to overlay the atlas much more um, precisely. Uh, and an example of that is shown here on the right-hand side of this 3D volume as we're going through. So this has been registered for the autofluorescent green data, and you can see the atlas outlines are shown here in, in white. Um, and this transformation has, has then been used to deform also the red uh, CMDII tracks as well. So you can see that what you end up with is essentially your actual histology data now, hopefully well, uh, aligned with and overlaying the atlas. So essentially you've moved your histology into the atlas space. Uh, and what this means is you can now uh, pick coordinates in your histology data and that will correspond to points within the um, Allen Atlas space. When I perform this registration, I normally do this uh, in both directions. This is more just to um, check for uh, the quality of the transform in an automated way. Uh, but this would also allow you to then overlay, for example, the Atlas onto your original histology. Uh, if you were doing things like reconstructing cells, for example, you might not want to deform your uh, original histology, you might want to map the atlas onto the histology, so that, that is also available in this. This whole pipeline has been um, put into a, a software package. Um, I'll put the link on the chat as, as Matteo suggested previously. Um, I mean, this is still a work in progress, and you know, if you have any problems with it, please contact me. Um, but essentially, this is just really just running one command, and uh, the, the kind of Elastics framework takes care of a lot of the complex mathematics underlying it for you, which is great. Okay, so once you have your data registered to the CCF, oh, I just wanted to also mention a few things about this particular pipeline. So the pipeline I'm using uses some image pre-processing and then performs the Elastix transform. And I found that, you know, basically smoothing your uh, sample image beforehand does a very good job at uh, allowing you to get very good accurate registrations. And one of the ways I've assessed it is what's shown in this data here is basically where I have identified 3D landmarks uh, within the CCF. These are landmarks that you can identify in 3D space quite well. Uh, there are 14 landmarks I've identified, and I've then gone and identified them in the original histology, in this case for uh, a series of five samples from the International Brain Lab. Um, and then I transformed that histology data and those points back into the CCF space. And I can then look at the, the distance between each of those landmarks in the CCF space, as I've defined, and also the transform ones from the histology. And this distance gives us an, a measure of the accuracy of the registration at these points. And in general, the registration accuracy on average is around 25, uh, or I think it's around 30 microns actually when I've looked uh, more extensively, but in this data set, it's certainly around 25 microns, which is around one pixel error on average. Um, obviously, different brains uh, can have variance in this, and this is mainly driven by uh, usually problems with damage in the histology, damage of the tissue. Um, but in general, it does quite a good job, as, as I think you probably saw before in the, the previous um, fly through and the, the 3D fly through of the data. Uh, the second thing is how does it deal with damage? Generally, it does quite a good job. So sometimes when you insert a mirror pixels probe, certainly this was a problem we had early on in, in the International Brain Lab recordings. Uh, there would be cortical damage um, due to the, the way the insertions were made. Um, and the, the registration itself does seem to handle this damage quite well. So where you can see, for example, in this particular sample, uh, there is some cortical damage on either side of these two um, tracks where they've, they've been inserted. Uh, 
the registration tends to map the damage correctly, so to speak. So in other words, it doesn't just draw this point up to the edge of the cortex, it, it correctly maps the damage within the Allen Atlas space itself. And I've seen it quite consistently across a number of samples where there is this problem. Although I'd say that we've, uh, there's been refinements in the way that neural pixels probes have been inserted uh, to minimize this, this issue. Um, I, I think probably Nick would be the best person to talk to about uh, exactly that process. Um, and so finally, once you've got this registered data, uh, so you have your histology registered onto your CCF, the final step then really, the, the, the only real manual part of this um, procedure is then actually tracing your tracks. So uh, in the International Brain Lab, we use a software called Lasagna, which was developed at the Sage Welcome Center by uh, uh, Rob Campbell, our uh, uh, microscopy uh, uh, lead here. And, Essentially, what this allows you to do is, is visualize your uh, tissue in 3D space using this kind of XYZ layout. Uh, and you can see here we have our, our tracks here. And essentially, um, there are various plugins that you can use, one of which is to be able to trace a track. And so basically, this allows you to pick various points that you can put along, for example, this track here. Uh, and so you would then uh, be able to export those points as essentially like a histology track. And so once you have that data, um, you can then go on to, uh, well, first you know exactly where your probe is in uh, the Allen Atlas space, because those coordinates will correspond to Allen Atlas due to the registration. And the next step, which I think May will be discussing next, is how do you then pinpoint your actual recording sites along that histology track? And because of the registration, uh, it's not just as simple as saying they're going to be linearly mapped. There's going to be all these weird nonlinear compressions and stretchings along that track that you need to account for. And that's, this is exactly the uh, um, problem that Mayo's software solves that we should talk about next. Okay, so that's all I have to say for today. So as, as uh, Matteo said earlier, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll, I'll um, answer them as best I can. If you have any question, further questions that come to you, please feel free to email me. Um, and I just want to say, you know, big thanks to the IBL, especially Nick and Carell, who's, who've really been very helpful in the um, histology work group that we're working in there. And also at the SWC, a big thanks to Rob for his help with the, the software and, and Tom Nassif Global as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. We've got still a few minutes. And maybe uh, I have a question for both you and Andy. That is, um, if somebody's starting from scratch and needs to decide, am, you know, am I going to slice up the brain and then put it in slides, or am I going to use a two-photo microscope to slice it up and image it, or am I going to clear it and put it under a um, what's it called? Light sheet. Light sheet microscope. Besides the obvious money considerations. Um, what other considerations are there um, and what would you advise a new person and maybe also Andy can pipe in after you've said your, your opinion yeah okay so I guess it really depends what you'd like to do with the tissue as well so um, clearly the easiest kind of hands-free way of doing it would be just to use the serial section two photo microscope but the problem with that is once you section the tissue um, it's, it's gone away. If, if you were uh, interested in doing some clearing and, and histology on cleared tissue blocks, thick blocks of tissue, then clearly the light sheet would be uh, more favorable for that because at the end of that process, you still have the whole brain. Uh, so that's a key um, point of that. In terms of the slicing, I mean, maybe I can uh, jump in here and, and say, uh, comment on this a bit further. Um, it will be more labor intensive. So if you have the time to do that, then then that is fine, but I guess uh, these methods are just a bit um, a bit more automated, really. Yeah, I um, I think that money is definitely the biggest issue. Like, if I were to start a lab now, I you know you can't ask for a crazy two photon money to do serial tomography. Um, so in our lab, where we are super lucky to have both options, um, I've defaulted to telling. Um, the people that do histology to do whatever's easiest for them, which in our case is actually serial tomography now because of the, or, you know, the serial two photon. Um, that being said, 
uh, slice histology is totally fine for doing probe reconstruction in, in my hands. And in fact, it's it's so good. It's way, way overkill to do two photon. So in my case, I don't get anything more from two photon except that it lives here and we can do it. Um, so that's what my two cents is. Maybe I would point out also on the um, cost uh, issue, the Allen Institute um, uses an optical projection tomography system. So they they clear the brains, you have the whole 3D brain that's cleared. Um, and then the OPT is a way of um, imaging that cleared brain from a whole bunch of different angles and reconstructing in 3D. And it's very, very cheap to do. Um, they have published um, uh, an open source way to build it, I think for like a few thousand dollars, it's really cheap. Um, the trade off, the, the general trade off is that the resolution is much lower than light sheet and it's way, way lower than the serial two photon. Um, but as Andy said, the serial two photon is, is overkill for this. And actually, the OPT is fine for the resolution you need for this particular. If all you want to do is track the probes, I think the OPT actually can be a nice solution. It, it would be more labor intensive to build the thing in the first place, um, but it's not expensive to do so. Um, there's a question from Jim Gong, and I'm partial to her question because it's a cool question, and she's about to join our lab. Um, and so uh, she asks, is, there, is it too crazy to imagine that we might be able to tell which exact neurons we've recorded from? And okay, so, so you might actually address this later too, but um, is it just too crazy or is it conceivable? So uh, this means. So by this you mean, is it possible to identify histologically the neuron that has been recorded from yeah. I think that one of the big problems that would probably um, uh, be a challenge to overcome with this is how much uh, um, glial and immune reaction you get around the probe tracks. I think if you did quite acute recordings and quickly perfuse the tissue, you'd be in a much uh, better. Um, you'd have a much better chance of being able to identify that. Uh, but with more chronic recordings, often this is a, the, main, the main problem, I would say. Um, but yeah, I think that once you've figured out exactly where your channels are along the track, um, certainly you should be able to identify from a selection of, of neurons in, in the region, um, if you're able to label them, uh, you know, which ones it could be. Um, I, I, I don't think it's inconceivable to think that would be possible. Nick, do you want to pipe in here? Yeah, we're trying to um, to do this uh, process of identifying the individual neurons that are recorded extracellularly using these ultra dense um, neuropixels probes that we're kind of like developing and testing. Um, and yeah, our strategy is not exactly what uh, she described, but uh, maybe we can we can discuss later. I think it's a very hard problem, and it's not clear we're going to.